So, Sam Brown, well, thank you so much for coming on to Forte Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here on a brilliantly, what's it, sunsetting uh, Friday afternoon. It's a beautiful day, and yes. thank you very much for having me. No, it's a great it's way a to end the week, actually, with an interview with you. Um, mm. You you recently finished a tour, is that correct, in France? That's right. So, um, well, tour is a grand term. <laughs> I was <laughs> just away um, for a couple of concerts mm. with uh, one of the groups that I work with, Fair Oriana. Um, and we had a really rather lovely time uh, in Strasbourg for uh, Amia Festival, um, early music festival. It was uh, rather a fantastic experience. We were touring a program of... Um, sort of early and uh, medieval and a little splash of folk music um, based around uh, the theme of Robin Hood. And what was very exciting this time around, we had an actor with us, um, uh, Tim Vaughan, who uh, recited a few ballads um, about uh, the life of Robin Hood um, and did it in this fantastic way that we were all a little bit worried whether... Um, you know, telling stories in English would uh, communicate well to a French audience. But fortunately, we had some subtitles. And uh, I think Tim was uh, a brilliantly convincing actor anyway. So people really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned subtitles. So subtitles in the program or was there an incorporation of technology as well? Yeah, there, it was uh, um, projected uh, onto a screen in both venues, which was very helpful. Ah. So we were seeing this uh, seeing this live. And I think that's, that's a good way to go. Yeah. You, so... Medieval. Um, do you think that's how we can attract new audiences by bringing old genres but incorporating new modern technology to help new audiences ease into it? Well, I think that there's uh, there's a necessary sort of interaction between um, uh, the music that we're all creating and want to share, and you know, in this day and age, the technology is how we bring that across. Mm. Um, you know, of course, uh, we speak as if technology were um, a, a modern confection, but I think that, you know, historically, people have always been interested in creating new instruments, new sonic possibilities mm. and new ways of communicating with audiences. And I yes. think that uh, in this day and age, you know, we simply do so through digital media a great deal. Yes, yes. Um, was this your sort of first, say, concerts abroad, or did you do quite a few before this French performance? Oh, um, so I generally perform abroad a fair bit, mm -hmm. um, but what made this very special was that this was the first uh, performance uh, that I've had abroad since uh, lockdown, since COVID. Uh, it was the first time I've been able to get away, and <laughs> it felt extraordinarily nice to be back on the road, you know? Yeah. Um, in a way, uh, of course, you know, travel, we, we, we're going to see some difficulties for that going forwards. But actually, uh, the flight uh, was not terribly bad, you know, all things considered. I think that once you get used to traveling with an instrument, you know, so if you have to book an extra plane seat for Mr. Loot, um, <laughs> you get used to uh, having to deal with difficult uh, travel, whatever happens. Yeah. You know. Is it, has it ever been a hassle, really, to, to sort of take your instrument with you? Um, once or twice. Um, I remember having to explain in fractured Italian at one point um, why it was that Mr. Lute and Mr. Guitar did not have passports uh, <laughs> to Milan Airport. Um, but it was it was a very smooth flight, I've got to say, you know, an entire row to myself and the instruments. Yes. But, you know, in this respect, absolutely nothing changes. Um, when uh, Inigo Jones, I think it was, tried to bring the first Theorbo um, back to the United Kingdom from um, from Italy. Uh, you know, of course, are you familiar with the theorbo as an no, instrument? No, if, if the audiences are not familiar, can you yeah. explain to the audience? Of course, yes. yeah, yeah. So um, a theorbo is essentially um, a, a big bass lute with a giraffe neck. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a real mm, enormous instrument. It's taller mm -hmm. than I am. Um, and the reason for this is that around about the turn of the 1600s in Italy, the, this... Um, extraordinary new art form was developed that we call opera. Mm. And of course, this changed the style of singing. No longer were we concerned with sort of uh, very pure, equal madrigalian lines. Suddenly, um, vocal singing was to be, um, as they believed it had been in classical antiquity, um, very expressive and dynamic and single voiced. Um, so, you know, this gave way to um, an entirely new style of singing, um, you know, and an entirely new kind of ego, really. 
Um, and the the, his, the the little lute, the historical Renaissance lute, no longer had enough pluck for mm. this style of singing. Mm. It was very bass-centered. Mm. So, um, talking about technology, actually, um, uh, it was uh, a composer called Alessandro Piccinini, we believe, um, at least in his words, invented the uh, the theorbo or the uh, um, chitarone, which is basically, as I say, a lute with this very long giraffe neck designed to accommodate um, the long bass strings that you need to really pack a punch. Um, anyway, so, you know, it's, it's a fa fabulous and fantastic looking instrument. And, you know, um, my friends and I still break out into a cold sweat if we have to travel with one, you know, on a flight or on a train. It's a complete nightmare. But we're, we're, we're not alone in this. When the very first Theorbo was brought back to England by, as I say, by Inigo Jones, um, it was detained at Greenwich Dock um, for fear that it would be a papish instrument, that it was uh, a, a kind of um, uh, Renaissance uh, terrorist uh, oh, device. Oh, you know, so, really? Yes. So, you know, very little changes historically, really. Oh, oh, oh. oh, my goodness. But I think um, one of the pros of having your own instrument and taking it everywhere with you is that, you know, your relationship is such a, such a big part of your life and you develop such a close relationship with it. Very that true. when you perform on stage, it's, it's like it's one of you. It's uh, you feel that uh, I'm not saying it eradicates nerves, but it makes you feel a little bit more, I say, more comfortable. That's very true. But with a pianist, you're you're doomed to play different instruments all the time. You can't exactly bring. Well, there are certain artists out there who yeah, are. Yes, so I'm thinking of Glenn Gould here. Glenn Gould, who yeah. always had to travel and with his own piano. And, yes, and that's so correct. And Chris, Christian Zimmerman too. Oh, I didn't know. Taking that. his pianos um, everywhere. Oh. Uh, you can still do that if you're rich and famous, but yeah. most people don't have that luxury. Sadly, I so um, would you say that's a, a plus of taking? Oh yeah, for yes. sure. I mean, you do develop a real um, uh, 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 connection with the instrument you play, as you say. Um, I'm very fortunate that the the lute that I own, um, which uh, is, is an old instrument, it was made in the 1980s, hmm. um, was originally owned and played in by Anthony Rulli, who is one of the sort of founding fathers of early music and wow. the sort of godfather of, of lute song. He was the first person to record all of Dowland's uh, lute music. So it's very, very special to, to own this instrument. And um, something rather lovely about that instrument, uh, Tony had the rose, the, the sound hole of the instrument, gilded. It's, it's coated in gold leaf. Um, and this was a historic thing to do. The idea was that when you were playing by candlelight, mm. it would reflect off this. And so, oh, you know, it's a really beautiful affect, I think. I see. I'm very fortunate. I see. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a privilege to have that. But um, uh, it's very interesting what you're saying also about um, uh, traveling to your instrument and the yeah. sort of variation between different instruments. Um, I do think that, you know, you mentioned being a pianist, of course, there's a kind of ubiquitous um, Steinway or possibly Fazioli um, sound in the world. And, uh, you know, being a pianist, I think, you, you know, you come to anticipate this instrument. Um, and uh, one, my, uh, my ex-partner, in fact, is a um, uh, specialist in, in early keyboards. So I got to get acquainted very much with this world of uh, traveling to different venues that have very different mm. harpsichords and forte pianos, instruments that have very different characters and tonal mm. qualities and possibilities. Um, and I think that historically, there was much more variety and variation and color um, from one instrument to the next, mm. um, which is part of the attractiveness of that era to me. You know, it's yes. less homogenized. Yes, and and plus on top of that, the individu individuality of the person too, combined with that, mm. combined with the individuality of the mu of the instrument. Yes, for sure. And um, I think that's that's what we need right now. We need more individual characters. Um, we need more sort of variation of interpretation and sound world that people can create. Mm -hmm. um, I was just talking about this yesterday with the former BBC music editor Oliver Condy. We were talking about interpretations, oh, wow. okay, and, yes, and um, whether or not contemporary music has narrowed interpretation. That's very interesting. Uh, but what, what's your opinion on sort of contemporary interpretation of old works? Do you think people are Gosh. sounding sounding quite similar these days, do you, or do you think quite the opposite of that? That's very very interesting. I mean. Um, 
I can only talk about my own sure. uh, yeah. um, experience Absolutely. in that world and my own instrument. You know, I, I, I'm, I don't think as qualified as the former editor of BBC <laughs> Music Magazine to, to make that kind of statement. Um, certainly my impression as a, uh, a lutenist, as a historic performer, um, is that these performers um, were very acquainted with, um, uh, I suppose, creating and improvising music. Mm -hmm. And historically, this has very much been the case, you know. Um, they, if one was a musician, one was expected to be a performer and a composer. You would be writing pieces, you'd be teaching pieces. Um, uh, you would be probably publishing a method, these kinds of things. You know, all of these were um, standard activities for, for a musician. So there's a kind of um, musical toolkit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a musician historically would be very up on their craft, the, the craft of composing, the craft of harmony and so on. And uh, this is the approach that I prefer to take um, as a musician. I think that um, there is a temptation to take a look at the music that is on the page and simply to perform that, you know, um, to realize that according to what's there. Yes. And that's fine. Um, but um, to me, I like to imagine what it would have been like to have been, say, John Dowland looking at the score. And, well, one would be uh, editing mm. bits of the music. You'd be um, uh, improvising, perhaps, um, changing voices if you wanted to. Um, adding ornaments, adding divisions, and all of this in order to react to the music that's on the page and to the, the person you're working with if you're accompanying. So, um, and I think that this is uh, the difference in approach here between um, treating the music as a kind of museum piece that needs to be articulated purely mm. and actually living it, you know, imagining mm. what it would have been to be Mozart on stage performing. Yeah. Um, you know, one, one absolutely classic example of that, I think, is um, if you look at the Mozart piano concerti, mm. say. Um, now, during the uh, uh, orchestral sections, you know, the piano part would not be silent. You, you wouldn't just be playing rests. You know, you would be playing the, the along with the orchestra, mm. you'd be improvising a continuo part mm. to go along with, with that. Um, and this is a much more, you know, kind of real and involved way of playing that concerto. And it makes sense if, if you imagine being Mozart or Haydn um, being sat on stage and uh, playing this music that you have written. Um, and you, you see what I mean? There's yes. a much more kind of uh, connected quality to this. Yes. I, I think that what, what, you know, kind of after... Um, the, the, the capital R romanticism sort of hit the world like a ton of bricks. Um, I think that there became this very um, uh, meticulous ideal. And the idea here is that the composer is, uh, is the great genius, the great artistic creative genius, and that they have put this, this confection into the world and it must be followed exactly true to, to the note that is, that is on the page. You know, Stravinsky, for instance, was, was absolutely um, ruthless about uh, interpretations, um, sometimes to his cost, actually. Mm. Um, there's, there's a very famous example when he recorded, I think it was the, uh, um, either the Rite of Spring or the Firebird Suite, I forget which, he recorded it twice. And each time he said, this is the, the um, unilaterally the... Uh, uh, the, the seminal performance of the work, you know, this is how it has to be performed. And of course, both times it was completely different. <laughs> you know, so, you know, um, so uh, you know, you can see that uh, I, I'm, I'm a disbeliever in, in, in that there is a perfect finished product that we yes. need to put out into the world. I think that it's, it's very much a process. Hmm. I don't think there is that sort of seminal interpretation. I think it's always uh, evolving and people are always finding new ways to to sort of play a piece. The the most prominent example is um I don't know if you've been following the Chopin piano competition. I haven't sadly. Uh the one in 2015. It was won by the South Korean pianist Cho Sung Jin. And um you know Chopin it's been played thousands of times, it's been interpreted thousands of times mm -hmm. and you always think you know coming up with a new angle and new expression is going to be tremendously difficult for every successive person because that's one that's one interpretation down. You can't take that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been heralded by that, someone yeah. else. So, so, um, but Cho Sung Jin, he, he found a very 
unique way of playing Chopin's music that has never been heard before. Mm, and it's been it's been celebrated worldwide for it. And you know, and it's been heralded as the, the greatest benchmark of Chopin interpretation. And he's mm. only twenty six years old, twenty seven years old. Yes. And um I just think, you know, where does it come from? Mm. Where does this this uh, energy and musical expression, this mature musical expression that has never been done before? Mm. Does it come from boldness? Does it come from authenticity? What What do you think? That's a very interesting question. My goodness. Um, again, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to answer the question. Um, you know, I disagree with you that um, uh, it gets harder and harder okay. to interpret yeah. a particular work because um, the way that I see it is mm -hmm. that... Um, any work of music, if we look at a score, it's uh, a musical score is like DNA. You know, it's the it's a set of instructions for realizing a particular piece of music. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, there's uh, what we see on the page is not the music. It's it's the instructions that we're taking to to, to create this, and, and in this way, it is like DNA. And you know, um, much like DNA, it requires um, a realizer. You know, the, the, it presupposes an interpreter, a performer. And each individual person is necessarily different. We are all coming to music from different histories and different backgrounds and different, mm. you know, the music will mean different things to each of us. And so my feeling is that uh, for as many performers of, uh, of Chopin as there are, there will be as many um, differing interpretations, you know. Um, when it comes to an interpretation that, um, as you say, is you know, groundbreaking. I'm always slightly conscious that, um, you know, they say one, one of the great issues with uh, being a composer in this day and age is mm. the uh, re almost a requisite to have one's own unique musical voice mm. sort of immediately off the bat. Mm. Um, and I think that that's a huge responsibility um, for uh, for anyone to say, I have this interpretation now. I have, you know, this is my way of doing things. It's also a very limiting approach because you then feel sort of beholden to that particular form of expression. Um, and I think that as a performer, we have to be very conscious that we are not doing things uh, in order to be new or groundbreaking. You know, I think that this down this road there lies uh, um, uh, a, a kind of affected form of, of, of performing and exaggerated um, kind of performing. Um, I think this is something to be to be watchful for. But I think that provided um, the music we are playing is in, in a way emotionally or psychologically true to us. You know, if we've trained ourselves as a good realizer of a score in that we can see what's on the page um, and kind of get into the composer's intentions. And then if those intentions ring psychologically true to us, I think that this is the hallmark of a convincing interpretation. Mm. Yeah. Because there, there isn't that disconnect between the music and the person. If you try to interpret a piece that's psychologically and musically and emotionally true to you, there's that unifying element that leads to authenticity. Is that what for, you're trying for, to say? For sure, exactly. Yes. It's as, you know, uh, I think that, uh, that that's exactly true. We have to kind of empathize with what we see on the page. It has mm. to ring true for us also mm. um, and be an experience that we agree with uh, on yes. some level. I think that's that, that's why. And maybe that's when people start nodding their heads in agreement. Mm. You know? Because the unifying, the unified person on stage is the most convincing performance is the most emotionally uh let's say satisfying performance sure it's you know they've um uh everything that they have to say musically is being backed up by their own experience of what mm. is true you know so even whether or not you agree with that at least it has to convince you know it, yes. it's a true thing that you're hearing exactly you know, that's that's my impression anywho Actually, yeah, I, I actually agree with you now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm chuffed that I can convince you that. <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, I, I, something slipped my mind, but let's, yeah. we'll come back to that. No um, so you, you study classical guitar with Sasha Levtov. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if we can explore um, 
Maestro Levtov's influence on you as a musician growing up? <laughs> For sure. Well, Sasha was my, my very first uh, music teacher, my first guitar teacher. And uh, I had lessons with him from when I was 13 to about 17. Um, he still runs, um, back in my in my hometown, Bognor Regis, he still runs the West Sussex Guitar Club and the Regis School of Music, um, these sort of wonderful uh, organizations. Um, Sasha is an extraordinary fellow, and uh, I found him to be a very inspiring uh, teacher. In, in the four or five years that I went for lessons with him, I never once felt um, that I hadn't achieved anything. I never once felt that, um, uh, that I hadn't uh, left feeling better than when I walked in. You know, there was always this sense of, uh, of connection and, uh, and understanding between us on a personal level. Mm. And to hear Sasha speak, it is as if um, Bach had been written yesterday. You know, it's it's this level of um, enthusiasm and and uh, 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 desire to bring music into the world, um, which is an absolute driving force. And so that is the thing that I always connect with with Sasha: the sense of. Um, the love of music and the immediacy of music and you know the the need i think that we all have to hear it you mm. know the, the the power that music has i believe to make life a better place you know what's the most memorable thing he's ever said to you oh good lord um or taught you well uh many things um but i'll never forget actually when i when i first went to um to music college and I did not have a terribly successful first year at college. I was, um, I found it very difficult to, ju to adjust to London life and to that hard pace. And I felt very disillusioned with the, the classical music scene at that point. And uh, I remember uh, Sasha giving me the advice uh, never to let um, what he described in this wonderfully uh, archaic Russian way, never to let um, human imperfections stand in the way of music <laughs> you know, isn't it just <laughs> <laughs> but i've never forgotten that it's a very beautiful thing and there is a quote that uh, you know music is wonderful the music industry is not <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned um, disillusioned about the industry what, what were you disillusioned about oh i was at that time i was uh, an 18 year old music student who'd just come to london from a very small town and I felt very out of place. Um, mm. I was not yet familiar with uh, how things worked. Mm. Um, I think that uh, music is a difficult uh, career to be in because it is subjective to an extraordinary degree, I think. You know, there's a variety of differing opinions and trajectories that we've all taken to arrive at creating music. Mm. Um, in a way, um, that is the downside of music being such uh, an emotionally rooting and connecting thing. I think that we all get very connected to, um, you know, uh, to pieces of music. You know, it means certain things to each of us individually. And so we can all have very strong ideas about what we come to music for and what we want to do with it. Um, I th there is one quote that um, two people with the same... Um, what's the word? Two people who hold the same tenets probably means mean very different ends by them, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you, and uh, I think this is very true for something that is so connected and so, um, as I say, can be so subjective as music, you know. And in this regard, you know, there's always a, 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 a plethora of um, differing opinions and differing uh, uh, viewpoints and stances to take to music. So... It can be a difficult profession in that in that in that light. Hmm. W were there talking about subjectivity? Mm -hmm. Were there any things you disagree with Maestro Levtov about? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> 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 well, oh, Sasha would be blushing to hear uh, him described as uh, Maestro. You know, <laughs> uh, he's, maestro. he's he's still um, uh, very. Uh, 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 bashful about being a professor of guitar at uh, the <laughs> University. Uh, <laughs> but, um, oh, something that uh, um, 
uh, we, he did not teach me was uh, music theory and harmony. Um, he did, on the other hand, export that responsibility to um, a wonderful teacher, Catherine Ono, who I used to have lessons with. Mm. So, uh, you know, he acknowledged that. Um, but certainly, latterly in my uh, journey as a musician, um, acquiring the musical theory and harmonic understanding has been an extraordinarily important part of, of what I do. And there will be one or two people who remember me as a, as a music student uh, at the Royal College who would be stunned to hear that because I was a <laughs> firebrand in the opposite direction. I thought it was purposeless stuff. Nothing <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. you know. Uh, um, and all of my students will be sick to death of me you know, <laughs> hammering home the, uh, <laughs> the, the building the dominant chord um, and counting, counting harmonies on their fingers. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, yes, that was something I didn't acquire back then mm -hmm. that I'm certainly grateful to have picked up now. It's a, it's a very important understanding. Yes. Yeah. It's, norm it's normally the passions that, we're, that we have now were once neglected as when we were younger, growing up in our formative years. That's a very good the, point, the strongest, I think. The strongest yeah. passions we have in our, in our adult lives are more so. Well, there might be uh, some exceptions, of course. But, mm. um, but yeah, I mean... Uh, a bit like myself with uh, literature and reading, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've come to adore it now as an adult. Oh, yes. But when I was a kid, I hated it. Really? <laughs> I hated reading. I hated it. I couldn't sit down for longer than 10 minutes with a book. Yeah. And now I have a, a full on new mini library in my, in oh, my uh, Yeah, in my... that's that's fantastic. Yes, yeah. but it's, it's so normally this. Uh, um, what was it? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Carl Jung uh, phenomenon. Uh, enantiodromia is the things that happen in earlier life that come to be the opposite later in life. So I think that's can be said here. I think that's very true indeed. Yes. I, I, I really like that point. Um, you know, one of my, my, my uh, professors once described it that we're all looking for a sense of balance, you know, mm. trying to complete the circle. And I certainly agree with that. I think that it's true that... Um, we can often get a sense of things that we uh, we've missed out on mm. earlier on um, that drive us. Uh, there's <laughs> a brilliant little quote by uh, um, uh, Fenella Kunk. Um, uh, this this uh, hilarious uh, his, history spoof um, artist uh, pointing out that uh, William Shakespeare probably had a much easier time at school. He certainly did because he didn't have to learn William Shakespeare. <laughs> 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 Which, which is brilliant. completely brilliant, yeah. uh, and, and you know, and it's, it's true. You know, thanks to uh, you know, the education system, we all dislike uh, things that we're made to learn. Um, but the other thing that comes to my mind, actually, is as you say that, is um, what is fascinating. Uh, in one of my uh, absolute favorite books by um, Milan Kundera, "The mm. Unbearable Lightness of Being," he talks about the idea that uh, life unfurls symphonically in in the same way that a piece of music a symphonic piece of music develops you know we spend the first part of our lives acquiring the material um that the rest of our lives goes on to be a development of you know, mm. in that you know and and there's a sense of truth in that in that you know we generally are filtering our current experiences through the lens of earlier experiences that we've had you know we, we can't sort of get outside of that i don't think mm. um of course what's what i find rather fascinating about that analogy is the idea that you know fortunately musical material is very very flexible you know and if you know what you're about you can develop it in all sorts of ways mm. so a piece of music uh, a life that starts in the minor key can have mutated and uh, developed into something extremely uh, positive by the end of the symphony yes yeah you know? so you could have a tears to pick a d if you have a if you, yeah. have, if, you have a, if you have a sad childhood, you can have a taste of Life is a Picardic third. I like, I like the sound of that, yes. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. The whole, the whole uh, sonata of your life could be minor, but then at the end, you could have a, a taste of Picardy. It's a beautiful analogy, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. So uh, don't give up just yet, folks. <laughs> Even minor keys have, have major endings. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Um, so can you tell us how you came about to discover the lute? It was um, when you went to Royal College, that correct? That's right, school? yes, yes. Uh, with, um, was it Jak Jakob or? Yes, Jakob, Jakob Lindberg. Lindberg. Yes, yes, that's uh, right. Swedish uh, looseness. Right. Yeah, can you tell us a story about how this relationship with the lute started? Good Lord. Well, um, so of course, I, I, you know, I started out life as a guitarist. Yes. There are very few 
people in the world who at age 10 say, you know, mommy, I, I want to be a lutenist. You know, <laughs> surprisingly short supply. There's one or two and they are wonderful people. Um, I was not one of them. Um, but um, yes, so, you know, it was as a guitarist that I, I, I went to the Royal College of Music and, yeah. uh, you know, my degree is in the guitar. But um, while I was there, you get the option to pick up another instrument. And I thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not cool enough to be a jazz guitarist. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'd better pick up the lute. Um, you know, and I came across this, this you know, battered old lute in the, in the instrument store at the college. And sort of by degrees, fell in love with it. Um, mm -hmm. It was a slow process. Uh, I think at that time, there were not very many lute players at the Royal College. In fact, I think I may have been the only one. Wow. Um, and, you know, I was a second study guitarist. But as a result, I ended up doing a great deal of work as a lutenist and kind of being thrown into that world very quickly. Yeah. Um, and then the more and more that I studied the instrument, um, I got very involved with it um, because... It is, in a way, it's not just an instrument, it's emblematic of an entire culture, an entire ethos, um, a world of literature and poetry and philosophy and uh, uh, art that, that, that grew up around um, the instrument. You know, it was so emblematic of um, Elizabethan culture in that time and place and, and Renaissance culture, particularly. Um, so I became, you know, I... I, I, I I arrived for the instrument and then stayed for the uh, for the culture, so to speak. I mean, did you do a lot of research into the history of, of Renaissance history to discover more about the lute? And, yeah, uh, I mean, well, I kept getting involved in various projects that kept prompting me to go away and do my research, you know. So um, very early on, I got involved with uh, some academics at UCL who were putting on a play. Um, it was uh, a performance of The Tragedy of Cleopatra by Samuel Daniel. And, you know, as a consequence of that, I went away and had to um, do a lot of reading about what the loop meant to, um, to the stage for the Elizabethans and what it meant for writers to be using it um, and the interaction that it had with the poetry of the time, you know, how people would recite things to, to musical accompaniment, you know, what it meant symbolically and, and, and so on, you know, and uh, um, then something similar happened, you know, I was uh, asked to get involved with a talk at the National Gallery and again, you know, sort of various things um, kept prompting me to see, to find more and more elements of the lute um, culture, really. Um, it was an extraordinary instrument. Uh, this is the thing, you know, it occupied a very central place um, in uh, in the Renaissance mindset, in their worldview. In the same way that, you know, uh, for us these days, we would say that the piano is kind of the, the iconic classical music instrument. For them, it was the lute. It was the uniquely the instrument that could, as they say, carry us uh, all the parts of music, you know, uniquely polyphonic. And they were fascinated by it for the timbre of the instrument. You know, it's... it's um, uh, the lute never has to raise its voice. Uh, it's softly spoken and the same uh, kind of range as a voice. And so they used to call it the queen of instruments. Um, you know, they admired it, you know, ironically for being, or perhaps because of necess necessity, um, being in a particularly sort of violent and troubled age. Um, you know, they relied on the softly spoken qualities of that instrument. It became more, all the more entrancing for that reason. Mm. So, you know, I became fascinated by, by the instrument and its culture. And if you are interested in the lute, um, there is uh, a lute society that you can join in the UK and you can um, receive three times a year the magnificent publication Lute News. It's a, it's a fantastic ma magazine. Everyone should have a copy. You know, full of exploring this kind of thing. Um, anyway, that's what fascinates me and what I like to geek out about. I'll put a link to Lute News in the, in the caption for the YouTube video. <laughs> fantastic, yes. <laughs> Please read it. Please read it. Yeah. Um, there's been a, a sort of a an emotion attached to to sort of lute music is melancholy that's very true why, yes why do you know why that is melancholy well <laughs> how long do we have <laughs> so um for the elizabethans um 
uh, you know, the, the, the thing to start with really is that the Elizabethan worldview divided uh, the world into fours. You know, they're very good at that. You know, four corners of the earth, four winds, um, four gospels, um, four elements and four humors. Now, the, the theory of the four humors dates back to um, Greek thinkers. It's the idea that we have these four fluids in our bodies, um, blood and uh, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. Um, and each of them contains a different sort of uh, emotional characteristic. So if one has too much blood, one becomes very sanguine. You know, we still use that word. Uh, and similarly, um, a, a surfeit of black bile, literally melancholy, um, makes somebody heavy and slow and sad and brooding and thoughtful and melancholy. And this is the reason for that, for that word, you know, and, you know, this particular emotional state. And it's, you know, this is what I love about Elizabethan uh, thinking, is that even if it's completely scientifically ridiculous, <laughs> <laughs> there is very much a grain of truth in in their understanding, you know, when you are sad, you do feel slow and heavy and pensive and you want to withdraw. Um, and, you know, they, I think they were attributing this to a very sort of physical image, you know, the idea of this black bile and having too much of it. Um, and so for the Elizabethan mindset, um, melancholy became a very important emotion. Um, there's, you know, some great thinkers, Francis Yates, um, Anthony Rooley, who have given um, a great deal of, of, of uh, thought to the importance of melancholy for the Elizabethans. Um, it was, uh, there became, around about the mid to late 1500s, there became a fad for um, for melancholy. They were obsessed by it, you know, it was in t totally fashionable. And you found these very um, sort of pale, thin, black-clad uh, young men and women um, who were very sorrowful, singing songs to their lutes. You know, it was nothing changes. It was the first emo culture. <laughs> you, you, you know, literally nothing has changed in that regard. Um, and as I say, this, this became a very fashionable emotion. Um, I personally, I think that you know, uh, the, the reason behind this, as far as I'm concerned, um, is that... Uh, as the philosopher Alain de Botton d says, um, melancholy is a very wise emotion. Um, we don't become angry or sad in response to life's troubles. You know, melancholy is a sort of wise accommodation of the fact that life is difficult. You know, there, there are necessarily problems. Um, but perhaps the wisest thing we can do is be quietly melancholic about them rather than get angry or you know, get hysterically upset. And, you know, for this reason, uh, I'm passionate about creating a more melancholy world today also. Uh, I think that uh, it's an ironic thing to say, you know, hear me out here, hear me out. <laughs> um, you know, ours is an era that is very, very focused on fun and excitement and liveliness and happiness. And there's this um, great belief that, you know, if, if we can only find the right product um, or do the right thing or be in the right job or have the right partner, we can be happy happy all the time. It's all a personal choice. We can do it if you, you know, buy this or subscribe to this and so on and so on. And, you know, I am a great disbeliever in that. I think that that's a very damaging culture to have. Um, I think that life is much more emotionally nuanced. Of course it is. And um, as I say, I, I agree with Alain in this respect that um, one the, the wisest accommodation that we can come to with life's inevitable disappointments is to regard them as inevitable and get melancholy about them. Um, I think that this is necessary now. I think it was very necessary for the Elizabethans, not only because they had to contend with, you know, sort of miserable English winter, but because um, they had lived through a time of unbelievable paradigm shift, um, you know, uh, religious turmoil and war, and at the same time, scientific advancement. Um, I think it was this difficult, dangerous cultural milieu um, that uh, led to uh, an understanding that melancholy was a useful emotion. It was a necessary and inspired emotion. Um, this is the reason for the fad behind it. Mm. Um, and... Uh, as, as you rightly point out, the lute is very connected to melancholy. You know, of course, the, the image of the, uh, the singer-songwriter quietly hunched over their plucked string instrument, be it a lute or a guitar, is an archetype um, in, in, in human understanding. And 
Um, it is a delicate, quiet, softly spoken instrument um, whose exponents have generally been very, you know, they, they've created very thoughtful and intricate contrapuntal music um, for the instrument. Uh, I think all of that led to this um, association of the lute with melancholy. There's also a rather beautiful um, exploration of this by, by Anthony Rilly, um, who describes the lute as being not only associated with melancholy, but as a cure for melancholy. You see, again, hear me out. This is part of the, the, uh, the Renaissance mindset. Now, as I mentioned, they like to divide the world into fours, you know, four humors, four elements, and so on. And also four voice types, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And um, for them, singing uh, music, singing four-part music, was a way of bringing um, harmony to things that were fundamentally warring, you know, musical harmony here. Um, uh, so, you know, all, all the voice parts are, are singing in, in harmony. You know, harmony is a great um, allegory in many respects. And um, they associated the voice types with a different element and with a different humour. So the bass voice, which is heavy um, uh, and, and low is associated with earth and with melancholy. And at the other end of the, of the scale, of course, the soprano is associated with fire um, uh, and with blood, I think. So, you know, and again, I, I, I know a few personalities who fit that bill very well, um, you know. Um, and the idea is that you're bringing these, these, these into alignment. And in the same way that a medical doctor bring, for the Elizabethans would be bringing the four humours into balance, so it is that music would be bringing the humours into alignment through putting them into harmony. Mm. You know, it's this metaphysical um, kind of process. And it was their explanation for why it is that when we listen to music, we feel much better. You know, we feel like we've been cured of some emotional ill. You know, this was their understanding of, of, of the process of catharsis, mm. um, which I think is very moving. Yes, well, thank you for that explanation. That's a very good I, explanation. I, I, I did say it would be a, a bit of a lecture. <laughs> Well, uh, you were you were talking about the um, sort of melancholy being being a wise approach to the sort of um, real life's inevitability of disappointment, mm. serving disappointment on the plate. Sure. You. Yes. Exactly. And I, good, and good I, I, I agree. Um, and you mentioned that back then there were like religious turmoils. There were sort of say warring com uh, warring um, sort of between people and stuff like that. War was mm. quite prevalent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and has always been. Yes, yes. yes. And um, would you say sort of this mel this melancholy approach would be quite suitable now in our modern age with the the advent of new technologies such as artificial intelligence and machine learning and wow. all these algorithms that are disrupting humanity? Now that's a very interesting viewpoint. So, um, which, well, so that could be a, a sort of a a backing up evidence of why melancholy should be brought back <laughs> into, <laughs> into, into our modern contemporary society. Because we have, you know, the coronavirus and mm -hmm. the introduction of AI, mm -hmm. which is going to be extremely disrupting. For sure. Both positive and negative. Yes. Um, but what do you have to say? Yeah, about that? well, no, um, I think that there's definitely an analogy here because um, we are, like the Elizabethans, going through a paradigm shift, mm. um, you know, uh, for them, of course, I think that it was preempted by um, the dissemination of information through uh, the printing press. You know, we have to re realize that what digital media is to us now is what um, analog media was to the Elizabethans. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a big change in the way that you process information. You know, um, historically, you know, e even earlier, of course, you know, when, when, when the printing press rolled out, people were worried that, or, or even with writing, you know, people were worried that you would forget how to remember things, how to, to tell stories, how to, to use your own mind, wow. you know, because this made the shift from remembering information to having it available in a library. Mm -hmm. And similarly, digital media has changed the way that we process information. So, you know, if, if, if you have to go and learn things from a book, um, you know, then, you know, this is quite a, a time consuming process. You know, you have to research and then you have to remember information. And that means that all the little bits of information stick around in your mind and they coagulate in into, uh, into knowledge, you know, as much more human, mm -hmm. you know. Um, knowledge is about taking two bits of information and spotting the connection between them, and then, you know, that, that forms larger clumps of knowledge in mm -hmm. our minds, so we have a much more sort of integrated intelligence. And 
Of course, um, what digital media has done to us um, is that, you know, if you or I want to want to learn something now, you know, we don't go to a library, we, we look it up on our phones, we look it up on Google, it's available immediately, data is available. But this means that we're very good at um, finding data, but not storing it, mm. you know? So we have, uh, we, there is much more information available to us, but possibly we don't take in as much as we, as much as we would otherwise. Mm. Um, now, you mentioned uh, that that's a roundabout way of explaining, you know, of talking about the similarity yes. you know, between us and the Elizabethans. And I definitely think that um, historically there is a great need for, um, for melancholy as an emotion, you know. Um, as I say, particularly in this day and age, I think that um, we, we have a need for this as as uh, as people as as human beings it's a vital part of the emotional spectrum and i think that it's something which culturally we are not really being given you know um, mainstream culture as i say is very oriented around figures that are uh, glamorous and extrovert and um, uh, lively you know there's a huge fascination with um, uh, with parties and being upbeat and i think that you know th this is why it isn't very fashionable for example to go and sit in the park um and stare at the view you know we don't see the, uh we, we, we don't see pictures of, of melancholy people on billboards trying to sell us things you, you know <laughs> it's, just, it's a very different uh, approach so I, yes. I do think that there's, there should be a place for it but this is this is a very strange contradiction i think because or paradox as well because mm -hmm. Whenever I meet someone else, I, I, I self-identify as someone who's quite melancholic. I see mm -hmm. the uh, how life can be quite brutal sometimes and unfair. Mm -hmm. I'm quite melancholic about that. Uh. But when I meet someone else who's also melancholic, I feel quite happy. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, it's, you know, it's a weird... Yes, um, absolutely. It's a weird dynamic. It's an important one, I think. Yes. Um, and I think that this also goes very true to the heart of music. Um, now, you're absolutely right. Uh, it's very consoling when, when you meet, you know, uh, like-minded people because you realize you're not alone with this emotion. And um, my belief is that this is, um, you know, uh, this is something, again, that, uh, that, that, that Tony really has always said, that there's this paradox that when we listen to desperately melancholy music, we feel incredibly elated. We feel <laughs> relieved, you know, because it's cathartic. Mm. You know, this is... Um, Something that has, you know, uh, brought out some of our own perhaps nebulous and unformed emotions. Um, you know, there's, there's a wonderful musical exploration of this by the composer John Daniel. I won't go into it now, but there's the idea that um, we are very seldom aware of our emotions. You know, uh, in order to get through life, there's a lot going on in the back of our minds. There's things that we haven't processed from last week, um, from, you know, when we had that argument with our partner or, you know, there's something that we, you know, maybe something about today reminds us of an unhappy childhood memory or whatever. You know, there's many things um, going on with us. And, um, you know, we are this, uh, but we're not always aware of it. You know, our consciousness is always focused on trying to get through the day. And so there is this kind of backlog of nebulous, unformed uh, emotions and thoughts sort of swimming around in us all the time that we're maybe not aware of. We're maybe more sad than we realize a lot of the time. And when we hear melancholy music or we see, you know, melancholy artworks, this has the capacity to draw those emotions out of us. You know, um, it make, makes us realize, oh, there's something there that um, I, I maybe wasn't aware of. But it draws, us, draws it out in a safe way, in a welcoming way, um, gives us a space that we can feel that emotion. And then having felt it, we felt we feel relieved. You know, mm -hmm. it is the process of catharsis. So I think this gets down to really the heart of, you know, uh, of what music is about, I think. You yes. Know? In a general way, I think that the the ultimate intention of all music is catharsis. Catharsis. Yeah. So it's a bit like a, I like, music's like a magnet and it sort of pulls all the things that it's... That's a lovely description. Yeah, it absolutely. It pulls all the things you don't know what's... Don't, you don't, you're not aware that's inside and it Indeed. just pulls out for you and mm. sort of separates it all for you. Yeah, I like yeah. that. Yeah. Well, that's a lovely analogy. I think I'll have to remember that, <laughs> sure. uh, that metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, it's nearing the end of the episode, mm. so I think I'll wrap it up with... Um, oh, sure. 
uh, a fine of our mark. Uh, throughout this episode, I was very impressed you could remember so many quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm very, oh, very uh, uh, sort of, um, I hold people in high esteem people who can do that. Oh, wow. um, and it's very, very in- entertaining as well to hear. Thank you. All the quotes you can you can put out. Um, is there a quote that changed your life and will be the one that will remain so, remain wow. of high importance in your life wow. until the day you die? That's a very interesting thing to say. Um, difficult question. Uh, one quote that I do keep coming back to uh, as I go through life, actually, is... Um, it's a bit niche. Uh, it's a quote from the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, mm-hmm. who, you know, of course, is famous as being this scathing firebrand, this sort of vitriolic <laughs> personality. Um, but in the uh, uh, there's a chapter of aphorisms and little one-liners in in his book Beyond Good and Evil, and these are all absolutely brilliant. You know, it's it's an incredible read as you go through them. Uh, you know, you realize more and more what a, a, a perceptive observer of life he was anyway something that uh he once said is that um in in the in this chapter is that everything absolute belongs to pathology was his view now what does he mean by that um everything absolute belongs to pathology well he means here that when we are feeling good about things we can tolerate ambiguity you know we can tolerate the the nuance of life, the fact that it has ups and downs, mm-hmm. the fact that there's good and bad in the world, or good and evil. Um, uh, we can uh, countenance, you know, many different emotional states and ways of being. We can tolerate people who are not like us, you know. Um, his argument here is that when we need things to be a certain way, when it has to be just so, it you know, it's 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 sort of rigidly dogmatic and necessarily this way. It must be like this. Um, you know, like Stravinsky with his recording of, uh, of the Rite of Spring. Um, this is pathological thinking. We cannot tolerate something other than that, you know? So this quote reminds me always to be open-minded, to countenance that there's a million ways to go, um, that there are different perspectives, that there is, you know, no one right answer. There are varying ways of being healthy. Um, you know, everything absolute belongs to pathology, maybe let's be a little bit more uh, more fluid and nuanced in our thinking. So that, that, that's that's one quote that, that, that I think of. Well, what a beautiful way to end the episode. Sam oh, Brown, thank you. thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs>